Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you have joined from. My name is Amit. Today's topic is Synapse Serverless SQL Pool and Spark Pool, which is better together. And our speaker for today is Armando Lacerda. And let's just quickly go over um, and let me take a moment, talk about the Data Platform Virtual Summit 2021, which is just kind of round the corner, uh, probably three to four weeks away. The uh, this mega event focused on Azure data analytics and AI is in the seventh edition. And there are some uh, very interesting announcements that I wish to make uh, for all of you. Announcement number one, uh, this year, if you book uh, the training class, you get the summit complimentary, which is you get all the sessions, live attendance, all the recordings of 120 sessions for the whole year streaming access. And you also get the training class content, live attendance and recording. So we have 15 classes that are lined up for you. There is a discount code, which is only made available to you, which is save 20. And using that, you can save $20 on uh, your cart value. So go ahead and choose your favorite class. We have 15 classes, as I said, we are covering a um, whole lot of technologies under Azure Data Stack including machine learning, AI, uh, data deployment, managed instance. We're talking about execution plans. The links are there in the chat window so you can click and explore all the stuff. Power BI is there, big data cluster, performance tuning, DAX, um, uh, Azure Data Pipeline implementation, PowerShell. You, uh, we are also covering um, uh, SQL, developer uh, stuff, et cetera. But uh, I want to take a moment and focus on uh, a special class because Armando is there with us. He is also delivering a training class for us uh, this year. And his topic is Azure Data Pipeline Implementation from Zero to Hero. Hero. And I will uh, give him the opportunity to talk about his class and what he's going to cover. So I'm, I'm sure uh, either before his webinar today, uh, or after his session, he'll probably spend a few minutes talking about that. Remember, these training classes are eight hours in duration, deep dive, demo packed, and uh, split into four hours each day. So two consecutive days, so you can really balance your uh, work uh, along with uh, learning. And as I said earlier, you get the class recordings. One very big announcement for all of you, friends. 125 sessions are already announced. So log on to dataplatformvirtualsummit.com, explore all the sessions that are available. And another big news for you, for a very limited time, maybe for next week or so, um, just a few days, you can register for the summit absolutely complimentary. You don't need to book any training class. Uh, the complimentary registration will give you live attendance. So you can access the whole conference, uh, but only live attendance. But when you book a training class, you also get the recordings of the summit content. So that's the uh, difference. So completely up to you. If you just want to attend the conference live, that's free for you right now. We have opened up about 500 seats. So what we did is we upgraded our virtual platform capacity to host more uh, folks from across the globe. Uh, so feel free and register yourself. All you need to do is go to dataplatformvirtualsummit.com. So this is something that you should immediately do after this webinar is over. And for us, content is king and we have deep focus on these technology tracks. So take a look at the content as well. Um, there, these 125 sessions are highly cu curated out of these 120, about 45 to 50 sessions are from Microsoft engineering teams and the remaining uh, sessions are from community leaders and MVPs and industry experts. So we have tried our best to bring you fresh content. We avoided content that is freely available on internet or YouTube. So uh, we, are, uh, we are ensuring that if when you log on to this conference in the month of September and you attend sessions, you will see up to date latest content. That has been our focus. Well, that's it from me. Talk to your managers, get sponsored, and uh, come on board, join DPS 2021. Remember, you don't need to convince your manager to join DPS live. That you can do absolutely free of cost. But I would strongly recommend book a training class. These are very reasonably priced, and we have some of the world's best educators who have joined us. 
they have helped us make these classes economically uh, available to all of you. So this, the, uh, the pricing is very pocket friendly and do not forget to use the discount code SAVE20. Well, with this, without any further delay, let's hand over to uh, Armando Lacerda uh, for today's session. And he's our rock star for, the, uh, for today. Armando has over 25 years of experience in the data industry, uh, uh, very uh, well-known and a popular speaker, uh, speaker consultant, trainer. Uh, he is also a data platform MVP for a couple of years, and um, he works out of Latin America. And uh, Armando, uh, it's such an honor to host you today. Thanks for joining us. It is my pleasure to be here with you, Amit, and to uh, with your, your group, your audience. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna share my screen here so you can see what's going on. And by the way, a uh, great uh, pack of promotions. Uh, I'm really excited about the, the event that's coming. Yes, I will be presenting there too on uh, data prop line from zero to hero, all based on Synapse. In any case, uh, let's officially get started here. Thank you so much for coming up and showing for this session. I hope you're gonna learn something new about Synapse Serverless SQL Pool and uh, Spark SQL Pool, how they work together. And this whole session is actually about uh, data transformation, right? Uh, the, the agenda, uh, uh, Emmett already uh, introduced me. Let me see here, there we go. Already introduced me. My name is Armando Lacerda. If you're not connected with me yet, please go ahead and find me on LinkedIn. Um, LinkedIn is my preferred one for uh, it's my preferred one for professional connections. Uh, I, uh, I usually post there about uh, a cloud platform and uh, big data and data transformations and all of that. Uh, Facebook is more for personal things. So if you want to be riding my motorcycle around here in California, you're going to find some stuff there, my go-karts too. And uh, usually what I put in LinkedIn, I put in Twitter. So if you want to connect with me, I'll be, and keep this conversation going after this session. You know, I usually uh, get some traction. People like to ask questions there or they did not come up during the presentation, but they want to share, they want to, uh, uh, you know, ask this, those questions in the social media and everybody benefits, right? When we discuss these things in the social media. So yes, please go ahead and uh, get connected, right? Like I was saying, um, this session about Synapse uh, Serverless SQL Pool and the Spark SQL Pool is uh, a lot of focused, is very focused on uh, the data transformation and how to get you from uh, integration service, so from SQL Server Integration Service. I believe if you are here, you are a professional, data professional, and uh, you do some, probably some transformations with, uh, with, uh, uh, in SQL Server Platform. And um, we're going to walk you through all the way uh, to the Synapse integration. And I do have a few uh, demos going on here, uh, ready to, to, to share. So hopefully at least those demos would um, will work. <laughs> all right, so, so yeah, in my case, um, I, start, I started working with uh, databases of like over 30 years ago down there in Brazil, I'm from Brazil, so this accent is Brazilian Portuguese accent. And, um, you know, I started as a developer and then I had my time with uh, mainframes and some old platforms. But then I started working with Oracle and started working with uh, data warehousing projects back then. And there was a lot of data transformations going on inside Oracle and store procedures. And then when SQL Server 7.0 7, uh, 7 came along and with SQL Server 7.0 came DTS, long, long time ago, um, um, I, we got to these tools, we started getting these tools about transforming data. And a couple of years later, we got SSIS and that was me. That's where I used to live, right? It all started here, right? In the beginning, there was SSIS. And uh, just for reference, this portion here is empty because I was supposed to be standing here. Sorry for my camera not being working. So this side of the slide here is going to be empty for the most part. In any case, um, data transformation um, was done in DTA SSIS for me. And, um, you know, I was, I was happy there, you know, as data coming in, we create these things. I worked for over a decade um, um, doing data transformations uh, and populating data warehouses, creating data warehouses. But 
um, as we move along and where we are today, we see that the future is kind of cloudy <laughs> for, uh, for this kind of technology that follows along with integration service. The, the, this technology of transforming data the way, uh, the way they were designed in the past, they, they lack some very important elements uh, that the future, which you know, I wrote that the future, but it's kind of the present today is where we live today. Uh, I, I put together three important things that I, I find out that's important that people should have in their mind when they're making their choices on how they're going to do data transformations and why uh, uh, serverless, why I like serverless SQL pool and Spark so much. So the first element why the future is kind of a cloudy is because of the higher volume of data that we process today compared to what uh, the, the old tools like SSIS were designed to work with. Uh, it, it's not just a, a, you know, a distinct or disparate type of data, data sources. Uh, as you can see here, I put you know, just three samples in here, you know, it's some sort of a relational database, MySQL for the, uh, and Postgres for the open source side of things. Um, those things were well handled by SSIS and the other tools. Um, they could push data, pull data from those things, and if needed, we could push also data from uh, to those things. But um, um, but the volume, as this amount of data, you know, this type, type, not just the source, the variety of the source, but the amount of data coming from the sources start getting bigger and bigger. We get into the same situation all the time. You know, it's taking too long to process that volume. And especially with the adoption of cloud computing and the cloud elements, one of the major elements that changed the game a lot is what we call the data lake. So uh, if you're not uh, there familiarized with these terms yet, you know, just for your reference, and I have a demo here, I'm gonna show you in a second, uh, the data lake is nothing else but a, a file system. And then you can compare to your uh, file, your shared folder, right? You're, you have a file server on premise and you share a folder in there and you find your files in there. So in terms of uh, utilization, us as uh, people who connect and connect, uh, read data from those places, is just like reading from files from a file share. Uh, actually, the, the, the service in Azure is actually called the file system because it creates a hierarchical file share, a, hier a hierarchical file system, I'd rather say. <laughs> so it really looks like a file share, but it's way more than that. The technology that goes behind these things, um, <laughs> the technology that supports a data lake, for instance, it, it, it's a piece of marvel. Um, the, as of today, I think the last the last update I got from Data Lake, uh, if well designed, and we're not going to go into the details, we can save that for another another session. But when a Data Lake is well designed, well partitioned, and use all the, the right techniques, you can get throughputs from the Data Lake that goes up to two terabytes per second. <laughs> and I wish you could see the emphasis in my face with the camera. Uh, we're talking about two terabytes of data per second. And with that amount of data and throughput, it's clear why integration service doesn't work well. And uh, the, actually it does not support that kind of data volume. And one of the reasons is the next element about the cloudy future we are, <laughs> we are reflecting on here. Um, in order to work with that throughput, we need compute because that's throughput, it's just the pipeline, right? The, the IO coming or going into the data lake. But in order to push that volume, you need to have computer power to push that volume. And uh, it's not just push the data through, but you have to transform the data, you have to process the data. And that is the uh, uh, one of the big things that uh, traditional tools like integration service are not really uh, uh, in part of and they're not they have not caught up you know the, the developers the software house they really left it behind uh integration service uh like in most of the other tools out, out there uh from a traditional approach uh, it cannot scale out you know you cannot create a collection of integration server uh, integration service servers and have them working together you know sharding a work among themselves you can definitely do it on your own. You can have multiple servers working around 
and you define your code, some technique to get the sharding there, but you are implementing your own solution. It's not built in, it's not part uh, of the product. The product itself does not support scaling out. And these two things, this specifically these two things, they, uh, they, they are the cornerstone why we need something else or something new, something that's more focused and uh, aligned with the type and the volume of data we're working with today. Um, the, 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 tyranny, the, the tyranny of having to scale out uh, you know, makes, uh, dr drives the point, in my, in my opinion. One extra element that's very important to keep in mind why uh, those, uh, those uh, approaches are kind of outdated nowadays is also uh, the, the change, the move from the approach of uh, extract, transform, and load to extract, load, and transform. And here it's a here's a very very important um, important uh, point that I, I really want you to to be clear on. So uh, here, <laughs> and uh, I have to keep apologizing because in my in my mind here I'm like I'm, I would be pointing to these things on the screen. I have to use the mouse here. So bear with me, right? So here you see a traditional approach. You have some data source come from some place. And you have, you know, here is an icon for Azure Data Factory, but, you know, you can think about um, integration service because integration service can't run inside these things. And the traditional process is like we read, we process, and we send to the uh, data warehouse engine, uh, whatever engine it is, it is, you know, Snowflake or, you know, whatever it is, something else, um, uh, Synapse, uh, Synapse dedicated SQL pool, for instance. So the data co uh, is processed by the factory and then it's processed again by the data engine and then stored on the particular proprietary specific storage place of the data engine. This is how we used to do, right? And it works, we know it works. The problem is not that it doesn't work, it, it works. The problem is it doesn't scale, right? The, re the real big problem here is we have issues with the scaling these things because data is moving to, is, is, is taking too many hops. So it goes from here to here, one hop, and here is just transient, it's just you know passing through and goes into this data engine here that has to process it again. So that this same data is processed twice even if there is no data transformation to be done here anymore, all data types are correct, everything is correct, uh, everything is cool, you know, there is no more changes, but the engine here, uh, the data engine will do its work, you know, to get that data organized, formatted, um, in, you know, in, in memory blocks and whatever else this uh, engine needs to do, and then store on its own uh, the proprietary data storage. Um, again, the problem here is uh, scalability, right? You, you have the data twice. Um, having multiple copies of the data is not the big thing. It could be an issue, but it's not the big thing. The main element is uh, actually uh, the amount of hops and the time it takes for the data to travel back and forth. And in our ELT uh, approach, right, the, 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 the way uh, we do data transformation today in the cloud, what we do is we get the data from into the same storage, right? The same technology, the same underlying storage uh, approach, which is, if you think through, uh, think about it, uh, which is what we usually do here too. You know, we, the data is outside the database, the data has to make its way into the database. And once the data is in the data warehouse and the database for the data warehouse, we play with the data here, right? We process the data here. We avoid going back or putting data out if it's not needed, right? If that doesn't need to be extracted or something. So we play with the data here. So ELT, in a way, is half of the, uh, of the, uh, of the weight of traditional ETL because we are doing this, but on a high performance uh, storage place, which is our, uh, our data lake. Right, so we are going into this one here. And again, in order to uh, have the benefits uh, or to, uh, you know, have the bet to 
take the benefit to have the benefit of using the high throughput that the data lake can uh, can uh, give to us we need to be able to scale on our data transformations and in order to be able to scale we need uh, new technologies so what does that mean or are you telling me that you know all the 20 plus years that my company has invested in integration service or invested in uh, other tools like integration service to do all the data transformations we do that work today if we're going to move to the cloud i have to rewrite all 20 years of working code uh you know it, it, you know the same what they say right if it's not broken don't fix <laughs> so if the thing is working in, in in the platform let's say integration service and it's working and you're happy with the way it is and you're just looking uh going to the clouds uh, moving your data center to the cloud, this change, right, the, the change of platform and the change of uh, uh, of the data processor is not really mandatory. You do not have to do that. Actually, uh, in this next demo, in this first demo here, uh, if you have not seen it yet, I'd like to show you. I have here a virtual machine that I prepared for this demo. And I'm looking around here for the virtual machine. Uh, here it is. So let me take it out of here and move it to this screen. There we go. So for instance, let's say, uh, you know, you are uh, uh, in an integration service shop and you, you want to get your things to, you want to get your things to analysis service and Okay, this is not my OBS. I was like, what's the OBS doing inside the virtual machine? No, this is my uh, local machine. This is the virtual machine. So if I go in here and call data tools, in my case, it's running inside Visual Studio 2019. Uh, if I go ahead and say, you know what? I want to create a new project. And this new project is going to be on uh, integration, integration service. It is. And notice that now on the current version, uh, I I used to have just integration service project, but now I have integration service with Azure enabled. If you can uh, see here, right? Uh, this second option here. And if I go for this one, I'm gonna give it in a name, um, SSIS in Azure. Let's go for a name here. And you will see that uh, I will have the option. See, so he's already asking me here uh, right now about a. Hey, you have chosen to run your to create a package to create an integration service uh, project, and with packages, of course, inside. And you said you want to have it Azure enabled. So, would you like to run your thing uh, in Azure? So the, that question over there is about, just about that, right? Do you, do you want to run uh, your, your package, the package you're going to create in Azure? And here, I really need to emphasize this one here, right? What it's doing, see, so it's giving me the option for data factory, which will go into data factory in a second. But notice, um, you know, don't be fooled. I'm going to make it short. Don't be fooled. Um, don't be fooled by this. You, your package will run in Azure and will run within a particular service called Azure Data Factory, but it still will not scale out. It will never get uh, any faster or, or more robust than it already is on premise. Of course, if you get a larger virtual machine, it can get faster. So, you know, be careful with that statement I just mentioned. <laughs> uh, it can get a little faster, but it will never be. Uh, as fast as the other data transformation tools, as the other uh, uh, data architecting tools. In this particular case, we're talking about the Spark platform here, uh, just because it cannot you know, scale out. <laughs> so if I say yes to this one here, it, it's super exciting. You know, as a, uh, as a SSIS guy, and uh, with for all transparency, all disclosure here, I have not done anything in SSIS in the past three years probably. <laughs> I've been working only uh, uh, on Synapse and uh, Azure Data Warehouse before Synapse. Uh, but, you know, guy, I missed this. We had a lot of fun with this thing here. So if I go in here and sign in, 
Um, let's see here. So uh, Intellect is sponsored my, I, I work for Intellect, forgot to mention that. Intellect is a consulting company here in the in, in US and uh, they sponsor these presentations. They give me an account. Last time I tried this, uh, it did not pop up with Intellect's account. Let me try another account here just for fun. I really want this thing to work for you. And it doesn't uh, sign with another account. There we go. Let me try another one from the MVP program. Let's see if that goes. No, it doesn't like this one. Okay, let's try your intellect again. Next. And my password is Nana, none of your business. <laughs> I learned that from a movie, an old one from a long time ago. And now I have to pick up my cell phone in here and do that two form factor authentication, two form authentication. Uh, form factor screen is not this. So there we are. And Password again. Oh, that's new. I have to authenticate twice. All right. Off it goes. Yeah. So if, uh, yeah, for some reason, uh, it's hanging up over here on, at, on in the Azure subscription. So uh, for this one here, I have only one, but again, it's the, my working account. I think it's trying to look into other customers' account too, to see if I have a data factor available in other subscriptions. Um, yeah, so the wizard kind of uh, hangs uh, in here, will not move on. But I'll be able to uh, show the, uh, the, uh, the rest of the presentation anyways. So what this one is doing, is uh, what the uh, previous dialog box just mentioned is it, it's looking for a data factory and is looking for an integration runtime to run my integration service package. So, you know, just to wrap up this, uh, this uh, topic here, let me go back to uh, this slide presentation. So we can uh, wrap up this one here. What they're talking about is inside um, Azure, that is this traditional service here for data transformation, uh, which a lot of people considered the, uh, the next thing after uh, integration service called Azure Data Factory. And in Azure Data Factory, you do have an action in there, uh, rather say an activity in there called execute SSIS package. So what the wizard is trying to do is to find uh, a data factory, a, a subscription, and in that subscription, a data factory service, in order to push the packages that come to create there to run on this environment. And, you know, some buggy thinking there, it did not work, but I do have it here also in the, uh, in the portal for us to check that out just quick. So let me find my browser. Actually, I don't need to find a browser. Let's get this guy here and let's check that out. So bring this one here. Come on. And let's go there, portal.azure.com. And let's go into my uh, Intellect account. That should get me in because I was I was already connecting there. Here's the resource group uh, I have created for uh, this session. Create these things here for these demonstrations. And uh, the one I want to go on a checkout is the data factory, right? So this is just the uh, the through the portal is just the um, you know this uh, uh, management portion of data factory. In order to actually work with the data factory, you have to go into the studio. And when we work with data in Azure, that happens a lot. You have a service like um, Azure Machine Learning or Azure Synapse Analytics. And uh, through the Azure portal, you manage the service, but you don't actually get to use the service. If you need to use the service, you have to jump into uh, the, this uh, parallel environment called the studio. 
which is super nice because um, I can give people permission to work with the tool without having to give permission to work through the portal. They don't have to touch the portal. So that is super nice. All right, so in here, I have here the, so Azure Data Factory, like I was, like I was explaining before, it is that thing about moving uh, the next uh, element, the next uh, uh, service that would uh, succeed integration service. That was uh, the perception, the common perception. A lot of people had that perception in the past. Uh, it's not really that. It's important to understand that it's not really that. Uh, Azure Data Factory, it's more of a, a, an orchestrator in terms of defining the sequence of transformations that can be done in multiple platforms. Um, and it does have a, the ability to do data transformation itself, but when it does, it relies yet on another engine, which we'll show you in a second. But just to wrap it up, uh, if uh, the topic there on integration service, um, everything I do in Data Factory, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, any data transformation needs to be done, is done uh, in a pipeline, in the context of a pipeline. And if I go here into the general, uh, here in the activities are all the things I can I can make, uh, I can use to transform data. There are a bunch of elements in here, you know, Azure functions are in play, uh, regular uh, load uh, and uh, uh, export to a, 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 another destination you could find in here on the copy data and also in the data flow for transformations. And specifically to what we're talking about, you're gonna find it here, see this right here, execute SSIS package. So what the wizard was trying to do is to do this, is find um, data factory, uh, ADF, and put uh, create a, a pipeline in ADF to put this guy here. And then you start setting up, and this, if you have any familiarity with integration service, this is start looking familiar, right? You are really uh, start, uh, setting up uh, uh, execution, um, you know, the hosting uh, process to run your package. So we may be pointing to SSIS database, or you could be pointing to uh, a storage place in the cloud, a file system, for instance, where you're gonna find a project or a package, whatever it is, and then you just point to the thing, where can I find uh, your elements? Where can I find your, uh, your packages? So your packages, all those 20 years of investment that your company has in integration service can still run in the cloud and you don't really have to put up a VM to run that, you can run from here. There are some gotchas in there, but you can, you can run it from here. What I really need you to understand is for things you have already created, you may use this one here. For any new development, you should avoid this one here because this will not scale to the point uh, we people do business in the cloud today, right? So this will, will not scale. So what should I do? Well, what Data Factory actually does, right? Because when it gets to data transformations and data tra transformations in the scale, what ends up really happening is, um, the, 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 you know, cutting the, the story here kind of short, the de facto standard today about data transformations in the cloud are technologies, technologies based on uh, the Apache Spark project. And the Apache Spark project, as you know, is from uh, Databricks. They created this thing and, make it, and made it uh, uh, public, open source. And there are many other companies out there who got that project and adapt in some way to run on-premise. Databricks itself uh, does not run on-premises, only runs in the cloud. Now, what's really funny here is Databricks is a product from another software vendor, it's not from Microsoft, but Microsoft is super tied with them. You know, they have uh, uh, team players on both the teams both on Microsoft and in Databricks. There are Microsoft people in Databricks and backwards. Um, they, 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 they have very good close interface. But the, the most important thing in here to keep in mind is a uh, data factory itself, it relies on Databricks when we do data transformations, not when we run integration service, right? So this thing I just threw in here, like I said, it does not scale. If I need to do something on scale, then, you know, if I go like for the data flow, for instance, if I bring in a data flow here, start defining um, um, 
uh, transformations for the data flow and some other elements there are around here databricks itself uh, in terms of uh, low uh, uh, code right if i decide to do my code on, on a particular language i uh, can also bring, bring from here and like i said data what data factory will do is orchestrate uh, databricks clusters called here the runtime integration runtimes uh, 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 orchestrate clusters and have those clusters running uh, transforming uh, your data and because it has these icons here and you can uh, connect one I uh, icon to the other it can define transformations and all of that uh, it, it feels like it is <laughs> some sort of a, a SSIS interface right because we all long for that interface again but um, it's not it's it's not even the same engine anymore it's Databricks so with that in mind let me go back here to the slide deck so data factory azure data factory is an option for that um, but again when you do integration service in data factory you are still doing this which means you're still taking to at least twice the time that would be needed if you work straight into the data lake so th that previous screen that i've shown before is kind of the uh, the demo for this one here so what we really need and here is the core, right? the title for this, <laughs> the title for this uh, presentation. So what do we really need? See, one of the problems is, if, if we're following along here, if I'm not doing too fast, one of the problems here is you're bringing data in from multiple sources, perhaps even through Data Factory, you're putting the lake and you are using Databricks, either Databricks by itself or through Azure Data Factory, which under the hood uh, use data, uh, uh, Databricks. And every uh, click we do there, it converts to Databricks code, right? In, in, I think it's in Java they do. Um, so the, the, the thing here is we are processing the data like we have seen on ELT all the time. We extract and load in the data. But what about consumption? What happens when we go into consuming that data? You know, the data has been cleansed. Uh, it's ready, good to go. Uh, in Databricks world, they call you know, the multiple stages, the bronze, the silver, and the gold stage of your data. And when it's ready to go, how do I consume these things? Because Databricks is not really designed to serve data like SQL Server is designed for, right? We connect to SQL Server and we do queries against SQL Server. On uh, Databricks, Databricks uh, uh, and you know uh, the Spark engines that are out there, their main goal is to do the data transformations, to do what SSIS would do, right? But in, in nested rights in a way more, uh, way faster, way more powerful. But they are not really designed to serve. Actually, if I bring here uh, my browser back just quick. Uh, if you look for uh, Azure Databricks SQL endpoint, there we go, Azure Databricks SQL endpoint, you see that there is a feature in Databricks that's coming up. Uh, is still in public preview, which means it's not that stable, which means Microsoft is not going to have an SLA behind this thing. Uh, but what it does is exactly that. It creates a, a computing process behind the scenes that it stays up and it's like SQL Server. You know, you connect to the thing and you run a SQL query and it will send the data back. But this, you know, people are using, people are testing, but it's not how the product is designed to work today yet, right? The, what the product just consumes. So if I'm going to get Power BI, if I'm going to get my uh, application to consume the data from here, um, I will either get something like uh, the Databricks uh, SQL endpoint up and running and pay premium price for that engine that will be processed the data lake for me, or I will uh, uh, leverage the power of the, the actual application and the front end I'm using. Like if I do Power BI, Power BI, does have compute in the cloud called Power BI Premium. So it can leverage Power BI Premium to collect the data from the lake and show in, in Power BI. But again, um, I'm not using the same environment for everything, right? The, the, the whole connection here, like I have one service for this, I have one service for this, I have one service for this. 
and I have to wire this thing up all together, make sure the, the, the authentications, everything are tied up all together, all neat and, and beauty. And this can be cumbersome many times. So that's where, and you know, just to make sure you can see that uh, on this demo here, I have uh, here on the resource group, right? I have it there, the, actually I already shown you, right? The, the data factory. I have already shown you there and the elements in there. Uh, yeah, and the end point, right? I, I showed you the, um, uh, Databricks endpoint. So yeah, so this demo is kind of kind of covered. So the real point, the, the big point in here that we're going to see now is the beauty of the Synapse integration. So we still have the same players. L look how interesting is this. Synapse um, workspace will bring you, for the most part, the exact same players. It will bring you a Spark data engine. Remember that Databricks is a Spark data engine, but it's a proprietary one. And there is a, a source, a, an open source project in Apache called Apache Sparks. Uh, Microsoft went out there, collected that project and re-implemented it, right? You know, it, it is their own tweaks to have it working in Azure for Synapse. So now you have competing technology. You have Databricks outside Synapse and you have Apache Spark inside Synapse. It's called call the Spark pool. So which one should I use? Databricks. <laughs> they are the best, right? That's the one I should use, right? They are the best. They, you know, they, 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 they made the technology and they mastered the technology. So I should use them, right? Yeah, I, I think that that's a strong point. But again, um, in many of the projects I've been working on, um, I have actually opted for the Apache Spark engine that is in Synapse if I don't need the specifics that are in the Databricks. So, you know, the Databricks has a, a, a very uh, well performing Delta Lake uh, uh, engine going on over there and with the time travel and all of those things. Those are great. An awesome technology, super fast. But if I don't need it that fast or that bright, shiny element in there, I will more likely be looking into the Spark pool that is in Synapse than uh, using Databricks. And why is that? Because of the integration with that, with the already existing GA serverless SQL pool, which I presented here a few months past, right, a few months ago. Uh, it's probably in the recordings. If you want to go back in the recordings on YouTube, you're going to find the session here. But the, 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 the benefit of the serverless SQL pool is it can, I can use any SQL, link, SQL tool, you know, SSMS, <laughs> if I want to, Excel, if I want to, and I can issue queries, regular T SQL queries, um, they're not 100% compatible, but for the most part, regular uh, readable T-SQL queries that will run against the lake, which means that I have my transformation going on on uh, Apache Spark, but I will also be able to read uh, the data that Apache Spark writes on the data lake from serverless SQL pool without having to migrate the data to a proprietary data storage, like as I demonstrated in the other session. So uh, the, the integration between these two guys here are king. <laughs> you know, this thing here is, is, a, is a champion. Um, the whole lake, the whole transformation, everything that happens on this side here becomes oblivious to my Power BI person who is just connecting to serverless SQL pool and bringing the data in. I'm not going to lie to you, right? full transparency here. The queries that are running here, they're, they look alike, but they have some specifics, uh, specific elements to them uh, in order to work with serverless SQL pool, but they're way more clear than, uh, you know, a, a Spark call, uh, uh, it's called a, a notebook, uh, if you're talking about people working with Power BI and familiar with SQL Server. So this whole thing here uh, it works way better, and it's all integrated. 
uh, the next demo here, I will jump in and show you the integration there. Uh, before I go in there, I just want to highlight that, you know, Azure Data Factory, that is, look, Azure Data Factory is a Microsoft product. But under the hood, Azure Data Factory relies on Databricks. So even for Synapse, Microsoft decided not to rely on Azure Data Factory to do the same job, which is give you uh, some sort of a graph user interface to create transformation pipelines. And we'll, uh, like uh, Emmett mentioned earlier in, uh, during the introductions, uh, we have this class coming, you know, two days, four hours, eight hours total uh, on how to leverage these guys here, not just the pipeline, but the whole system, including the dedicated uh, SQL pool that's not in the picture here. But um, uh, so there is a pipeline here, but this one, unlike Azure Data Factory, it does not rely on Databricks. It relies on the Apache Spark pool on this guy here. So some of the elements you see that some uh, some of the elements that there they that 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 exist in ADF you will not find in the pipeline or be slightly different on the uh, Synapse pipeline. Let me show you that. So let me go back here to uh, the portal. Here's my portal, and I got a Synapse going on here for us to take a look at. And like I mentioned, right, you have, you have to jump into the studio, uh, like we jumped into Data Factory into the studio. Synapse has its own studio, so we have to jump in there. Let's go ahead and take a look. Hmm. And this is one of the customers we used to work with. This project is over. Should not be showing this thing here. Oh, I see why. So sign out. And let's get back there. Click on you again. There we go. That should do it. Yeah, Microsoft doesn't make it that easy for consultant consultants to jump from account to account. <laughs> All right, so I'm back in my Intellect account. Here we are. And um yeah, so here is uh, the pipeline, right there I mentioned before. So here in the pipeline, uh, it, it, this is Azure Data Factory, but inside Synapse. And because inside Synapse is not Databricks, is the Spark pool. So the integration runtime is based on the Spark pool. And if I go ahead and create, you know, the, the way the look and feel is exactly the same, you know, very close, I'd rather say, uh, to the ADF. But guess what? In ADF, when I look into general, I could find in here, if you can recall, if you cannot, I can show you again. If I look here in general, I can find integration service, but in Synapse, no integration service. So just give you this glimpse in here so you can kind of see that you're really moving away uh, from, uh, uh, from legacy elements and focusing on new, things, right? New ways of doing the data transformation. And from here, of course, you can do all the elements we want to do, right? The same copy and data. We have seen that before. Some specifics for Synapse. So these are notebooks. You see Databricks as an option in here. We got the notebook. We got Java code. We got Python code. Uh, for Synapse, we also got a notebook for the Spark, uh, the, the Spark engine. Uh, job definition to, for scheduling, uh, SQL pool store procedures for that too, if you want to. Um, we can do the notebooks in C-sharp language, not in, in Java. Uh, Java is available too. Scala, I think, uh, no, Scala is just for Databricks. Uh, Scala is available for, uh, for uh, Spark pools too. But the, one of the, main benefits you, you're going to find here when you do Java and my time is running out. So I'm going to stick here for this like that just to wrap this up. One of the, uh, one of the main benefits you're going to find in here is this. Um, if I, I'm going to move back a couple slides here. Come on. It doesn't want to move back. There we go. So if I'm in the data lake and I create um, Data, uh, uh, Databricks objects like tables, data lake tables, 
uh, or you know even databases in databricks these are databricks metadata that it doesn't share with anybody right it's just for databricks so I, like I said, I could use serverless SQL pool to connect to the lake in here, but the lake will not be aware of any of the metadata that Databricks is creating. So I would have to create a database, a database in serverless SQL pool pointing to where uh, Databricks files, uh, the standard files are, not the metadata. Like I said, metadata is not shared, but where the standard files are. But when I do with this uh, Apache Spark SQL pool, Apache Spark in the serverless SQL pool. When I create a database in Apache Spark, that shows up in serverless SQL pool. When I create a table in Apache Spark uh, with the, you know, whatever language I want to use in there, the metadata is shared among these two guys. Like 95% of the metadata is shared. There is some specific elements that are not really shared in between these two. Um, but the, for the most part, um, pretty much everything is uh, is shared, which means that my level of management here is very minimal. It's usually more into data type compatibility when in the tool needs to read you know an integer or a float and then you have to decide precision and things like that. Then actually the the elements. So the tables are there. I can look into the tables and query the tables from here. I don't have to create the tables pointing to the lake. Like if the process of creating the gold version of my data through the Spark pool delivers, right? If I get the, 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 the gold state in here, serverless SQL pool will just scale because serverless SQL pool, and I, I recommend you if you are uh, interested to dive deep in serverless SQL pool to look, take a look on the previous session we had here a couple of, a couple months ago. In, in the serverless SQL pool, it does scale, it does what SSIS cannot do. Uh, inside serverless SQL pool, depending on the amount of data you are query and your partitioning strategy in the lake, you will have multiple compute nodes like a cluster of data, SQL data engine running behind the scenes, tapping the data into the lake with super high performance. And yeah, it's awesome. So that is the, that's why they're better together, right? Because serverless SQL pool cannot do data transformations. So if you wanna do data transformations, you have to do with the pipeline or the Apache Spark. But if you do with the pipeline, you're gonna lose the benefits of sharing metadata with serverless SQL pool. But if you do with Apache Spark, you do share that metadata. The drawback in here is you will lose the uh, graph user interface, you know, drag and drop icons and connecting arrows. <laughs> uh, but you will have the notebook in there to, uh, to write your code on. And that's pretty much it. Um, with that in mind, um, I would like to, again, apologize because I got some technical issues and my camera decided not to work today. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a shame, sorry about that. But with all of those things that we have just seen, uh, what are your questions? Uh, Armando, I would request you to just very briefly, please talk about your, uh... Um, you know, pre-con that you are doing the training class at DPS, just a few uh, minutes and then we'll jump over to the question. Sure, my pleasure. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's exactly what the title says. We will be uh, creating this pipeline as I've been talking about here uh, from ground zero, right? We're gonna use uh, some Microsoft data, uh, data, uh, data sets that make, they make available, but we're gonna do that in volume. So we're gonna blow up the, the regional data like in hundred times to get some terabytes of data flying around. And uh, we're gonna get from the first steps on how to uh, wire up the whole thing together and get the first data moving through kind of uh, not really transformed and then start diving into in every uh, step, in every layer of the data transformations and what can be done uh, uh, in each one of them with uh, exercises, with hands-on for, for all of them. Uh, we'll be very, very focused on Synapse. So, you know, uh, people love Databricks, but this session is not gonna be about Databricks, it's gonna be Synapse and the Apache Spark and what can be done and what cannot be done. Uh, in that environment uh, and all the integrations with the dedicated SQL pool, which we have not uh, spoke about today. 
and also serverless SQL pool, which is a great addition to the, to the platform. And the consumption layer will be, of course, Power BI. Uh, we'll see how the whole thing works together. Uh, and by the end of the, the, the workshop, uh, I expect the people that will be there, uh, they will have a very good hands-on uh, uh, and know their way to get the job done when, need, when it comes to transform data in the cloud. So friends, yes, uh, if you're keen, go out, uh, book your seat for Armando's class, and uh, do not forget to use the discount code SAVE20. And remember, if, even if you're not interested in the training class, absolutely no problem. DPS 2021 right now is free. We have a few seats that we have opened up, so just go ahead and book your seat for the summit. With this, uh, I will um, uh, hand over to Satya to take up questions. Yeah, there is a question from Sibia. Do you have to provision Databricks for ADF? Um, yes, but not in the same way. Uh, let me show you that. So in Data Factory, here's Data Factory. Uh, we have uh, these things in Data Factory called the integration runtime. And here is the, uh, the tab where we see the integration runtime. So this integration runtime here is Databricks. You know, what's happening under the hood in there uh, is Databricks doing, uh, doing the work. So you're not going to, data, to your question, uh, Savio, you're not going to Databricks, you're not creating a cluster in Databricks and presenting to Data Factory. You're actually coming here. And uh, from here, you are uh, tuning, either creating or tuning your uh, integration runtimes and defining what's going to be the, the processing capacity of your runtime. So like this one here is just up and running. It's not really doing anything because I'm just monitoring from here. So if I go here into integration runtime, uh, I have some information about this guy. But if I go here, I see I want to create a new one. Uh, Azure self-hosted integration runtime. And come on. And in here, West US for the elements. And here it's the uh, computing power, right? The, what would be, uh, how big would the cluster be, right? So we can define it from here. So doing this thing here, I'm defining what Azure Data Factory calls uh, integration runtime that will define the capacity of. Uh, the computing power of any notebook I want to run, I associate with this guy here. And under the hood, this thing is a Databricks, Databricks cluster. Good question. Thank you for that one. Yeah, there is a question from Swanand. Is it recommended to write code in ADF or Databricks for transformations? Now that ADF has made data flow transformations available too, is there any performance impact or cost impact of either strategy? All right, that's a complex question. Very good one. <laughs> but there are a lot of questions in this question. So <laughs> let's try to break it apart. Performance impact. So um, comparing drag and drop, uh, click, click, drag and drop, and your code, um, you have more flexibility in your code. So is that an opportunity that your code would run faster than the code that ADF or uh, the Synapse Spark pool uh, pipeline, actually the Synapse pipeline creates? Probably, right? It would depend on your expertise on doing the code yourself. Um, the code that's generated under the hood by ADF or Synapse pipeline is not bad. You know, for the most part, they work super cool. They work super fast. There are situations when they don't do the right thing, <laughs> but uh, for the most part, they work pretty nice. So writing your own code could be, but not necessarily will always be, right? If that's a good answer for you. In terms of cost, cost is something that you really have to uh, uh, dwell in, right? You have to look into um, the, the cluster. How, if you compare the cost of the integration runtime and the Spark pool itself uh, in Synapse and the Databricks uh, one, um, I, if, I, 
I kind of don't want to answer that question because I'm not really clear in my mind. I know that the Spark Pool can be slightly cheaper if you do the uh, Synapse Spark Pool and also the pipelining there. Uh, ADF can be comparable or a little bit higher than Databricks. That's my recollection, but I have to go back to you on that one. Yeah, there is a question from Dan Hess. Is Synapse integration cheaper than? Maybe he was referring to an earlier slide where uh, you are comparing Synapse integration and ADF, something like that. It's slightly cheaper, yeah. Because, um, you know, with Azure Databricks, you do have to pay Databricks for their work. And the Spark pool belongs to Microsoft. So the, 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 the license model is different. So the price is a little bit, uh, a little bit um, you know, less expensive on the Synapse side. But again, you have to be very careful when you talk about price and cost. You really have to uh, do your homework and compare both because it, those things are, they are charged based on uh, the size of the cluster. And if you don't do things well, we end up using a higher cluster in one and a smaller cluster in the other, and then the prices are off, right? So you have to be very careful when comparing those. Yeah, Hemendra has a question. What about uh -huh. the optimizations in case of using Apache Spark Pool? Can we customize stuff as we do in Databricks? Definitely, you have the same, uh, it's the same uh, open source engine, right? Besides what the specifics there is, that exist for Databricks. So when it comes to whatever is proprietary in Databricks, it works only on Databricks. <laughs> That's you know a given, right? Uh, but for the most part, all the techniques you do in Databricks, you can do in Apache Spark. So that's all the questions for now, Armando. So we really thank you time. Thank you all. Bye.